right, everybody. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Man, y'all are fired up and ready. You got extra sleep this morning. You've had your coffee for sure. Uh, man, I'm honored to be here with you today, man. Everyone, welcome to church. Also want to welcome everyone watching with us on live right now. Listen, you could have been doing anything this morning. You chose to be here. We are truly honored uh, to get to hang out together this morning. If I've not met you, my name is Matt Powers. And really excited about the message today as we are wrapping up our series, Life on Purpose. And this whole month, we've been talking about what it means to live a life on purpose. And you can't spend more than a couple minutes minutes here without hearing or seeing the words life on purpose. I mean, it's all along the lobby as soon as you walk in this building today because that is the thing. That is the main thing. What does it mean to live a life on purpose? We're all meant to have purpose and live a life on purpose. And all month long, we've been talking about exactly what that looks like. If you want to go ahead and pull out your notes inside your worship guide and follow along. For those of you watching online, your notes are right there for you. Listen, if you're not a note taker, that's cool. We all have bad habits. We all need to break them. Today is that day for that. Because I believe God's going to speak to us today, and he's going to have something specific that he wants to tell every single one of us. It's important for us to be able to take that with us. And the theme verse we're using for this series comes out of John chapter 4. Story is known as the woman at the well. It's a very popular, famous story in scripture. It is the longest recorded conversation that Jesus has with anyone in the Bible. But I want us to understand a few things before we really dive in today, because this story is so important for a couple of different reasons. But the first being just to understand that this woman was a Samaritan. Jesus, he is Jewish. One thing we need to know, Jews and Samaritans hated each other's guts. Jews would go around Samaria just so they would not have to interact with any of the Samaritans. And even though his disciples were like, Jesus, are you sure you really want to go that way? I mean, they're Samaritans. We don't want to deal with those people. Jesus like, no, we have to go through Samaria because he knew he was going to be meeting this woman at the well. Something else for us to understand is that all the pe women in the community, they would go to this well every single day to draw water. It was very important for what they needed. It was a community event. It's something that they always did together. The importance of understanding that is that this woman was all by herself. You see, she wasn't welcome to go with the other people of the community. She wasn't allowed. You see, she made some decisions that she wasn't necessarily proud of. Some mistakes were made. She had a lot of shame. She had a lot of guilt. No one in the community liked her. They said, if you hang around her, it's bad news. You don't want to end up like her. You see, she was an outcast. So she had to go to the well every day all by herself. Whenever Jesus is there, the woman comes up, they begin to talk. He's like, hey, I'm thirsty, you know, would love something to drink. She's like, well, pump the brakes real quick, big guy. We're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. We're not supposed to talk to each other. I don't know what you're doing. They begin to talk a little bit more, and Jesus is like, well, let's, let's pause real quick. Go and grab your husband, if you would, please. And she responded in the way, just as Jesus knew she would. She says, well, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, absolutely, you don't. You've had five of those guys. None of that worked out. You're shacked up with some bro today. He's not your husband either. I don't know what in the world is going on. She's mind blown. She's like, who is this guy? You must be some sort of prophet. And then she begins to learn that this is the Jesus that we all know, that he is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. It's important for us to understand this because this woman wasn't welcome. She was an outcast, made bad decisions. Just goes to show that if any of us feel in that same boat today, if we've made bad decisions, we have shame, we have guilt, we have mistakes, Jesus can use us just as he used that woman in the well. The other part of that is where our theme verse really comes out of, and it's verses 13 and 14. Jesus says, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. And we read that practically, and we're like, well, that's not the water I have, because I drink this, I'm thirsty all day long. What's this water, Jesus? Is it special water? Is it that expensive Voss water? Is that what this is all supposed to be about? I really don't know. What kind of water is this? But that's not necessarily what he is saying. You see, she went to this well day after day after day after day to try and fill the needs that she had. Maybe some of us are going to the same well day after day after day after day to try and fill the voids that we have in our lives. Maybe we're going to the bottle day after day after day to try and fill a void that we're missing. Maybe we're texting that person behind our spouse's back to fill this void that we're just missing in life. Maybe we're going to that website or doing this or doing that. We're going to the same well day after day after day because we feel like we're missing something. And it fills that void momentarily, but then soon enough, it's gone again. That's what Jesus is saying. You don't have to continue to go to the same well day after day after day, because what I give is going to fulfill you. I'm going to give you hope. 
I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to give you something that nothing else can offer. And that's the reason we're here. That's what it is to live a life on purpose. And in week one, we talked about our passions. So we're passionate about God. We're passionate about people. We are passionate about our purpose. In week two, we said we're not going to settle for good. We're not going to settle for the things that the world offers us. No, we're going to go for great because that's what Jesus offers us. We're going to live a life of significance. We're going to have character. We're going to believe in the spiritual over the physical. We're not going to worry about the things of this world because if Jesus has something greater on the line, we're going to go for that. Last week, we talked about loving the leper. That we're capable, we're compassionate people. In other words, we're going to love what the world deems as unlovable. You know why? Because Jesus loves what the world deems as unlovable. And if Jesus can do it, why can't we? We're going to love the unlovable. And today, we've talked about the message, get equipped. Get equipped. What does that mean? It means if we're going to accomplish any of these things, if we're going to love the leper, if we're going to go for great, if we're going to live a life on purpose, we got to be properly equipped for the job. Now, I don't know about you, but I know when you look at me, you're like, that is fix it. Felix, Tim the Toolman Taylor, he can fix anything possible. I hate to break it to you, not the truth at all. All of our power tools at our house belong to my wife. I have no craftsmanship whatsoever. So when she comes to me with like, hey, we're going to do this project, I'm like, you know I'm not properly equipped to do that job. Well, just as it is to live a life on purpose, we have to be properly equipped. If we're going to go on this journey together, we have to make sure we have all the tools necessary to do the job and do the job right. And I know what you're feeling. If you feel like the woman at the well and say, well, I'm not welcome. I haven't done enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not the most talented going. Listen, God does not call the equipped. He does not call the most talented. He equips the called. He's not looking for the most talented. He's not looking for perfect people. He's just looking for someone to say, I'm available. What can I do? That's what it means to live a life on purpose. So today, we're going to walk through several things of getting equipped to live a life on purpose. So let's pray, see what the Lord wants to tell us this morning. God, we love you. We're just thankful to be in these moments and to be able to spend time with you. We want to pray over your word today. We want to pray over everyone who's listening today, God. Just pray over their needs. God, man, we're we're walking through stuff. There's things going on in our lives, and I just pray that, that you'll speak to us today. Maybe you'll bring some things to the surface, that we'll be able to overcome some past traumas, God, that you'll be able to do things that only you can do. And God, whenever you do it, we'll give you all the credit for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So number one, to get equipped, the first real step to getting equipped to live a life on purpose, you have to know your God. We have to know God. It's pretty important. He's the creator of all things. He created you. He created me. Might be a decent idea to actually know who this guy is. You see, he's all about relationships. From the very beginning, God created Adam, and he created us for relationship. He looked at Adam and said, hmm, not good for man to be alone. All the women said, amen. (laughs) Not good for man to be alone, so I'm going to create a helper for him. And he created Eve, created that relationship. God wanted to be in relationship with Adam. He gave him purpose. He gave him a job, and he was in the presence of Adam. That's how God created us. But then, as we know, sin entered into the world, and all sin is is those things that separate us from God. That's what sin is, and that relationship has been separated. That's where Jesus comes in. He comes back. He goes to the cross. He dies for us. He sheds his blood. And all is that to wipe the sin away from the world. Why? To bring us back together with the Father. That's it. To have that relationship with him. If we look at John chapter 17, verse 3, this is Jesus. He says, and this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. To know God. You see, knowing God is different than knowing about God. When we talked about the story last week where Jesus reaches out and he heals the leper, that was a big no-no. That's against the law. That's no good. The Pharisees, they know about God. The religious leaders, they know about God. They know the stories. They know the scripture. They know everything there is to know about God. But Jesus knew God. And he knew God's heart. He said, no, God would want this man healed. He wants to want this man reconciled. He's going to reach out and he's going to touch the leper. Even though everyone's like, that's a terrible idea. He should go to prison. But he knew God's heart. And that relationship is so important. The relationship is greater than the law. 
It's greater than the rules. Now, the rules are important. The laws are important. But the relationship matters even more. If I look at my marriage, marriage has rules. There are guidelines to, to go by. I think we can all agree with that. If I just one day wouldn't answer my wife's texts or her phone calls and just didn't decide that I'm not going to come home, and I come home and she said, well, where have you been? Oh, I went out with, with her, and I spent the night over at her house and this and that. That wouldn't go so well. Wouldn't be married very long. Well, you know, I don't want to live by all these rules. That doesn't sound like very much fun at all. But see, whenever you have that relationship with somebody, you love the rules. You love the guidelines. You want to make them happy. You want to make them proud. You want to live a life together. Just as a marriage has rules in which I'm going to live by those rules because I love my wife, same goes for God. I love him and I want to live my life for him. I'm going to abide by his rules. Why? Because I want to make him happy. I want to look at me and say, man, well done, awesome job, fist bump, good work, man, good job. That's knowing God, having that relationship with him. Knowing God is deeper than just the religion. It's much deeper than just the rules. So what can we do to do that? What does that look like? I want to challenge to you. This is on your outline. We have to commit to Sundays. Write that down. Commit to Sundays. It starts here in his house. First day of the week. First morning of the first day of the week. We're going to commit to Sundays. That's how we begin to develop that relationship with the Father. It's important. Here's why it's so important. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. It says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. And on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, it's great, but I never knew you. When it comes to judgment day for us, are we going to be there and say, well, hey, God, remember that time I served at the egg drop and it was really cold outside and it rained? Remember that? That was great, wasn't it? Remember that time I gave for that one cause and that one thing? Remember whenever I served that one time at church? And that's, that's great, and it's needed, and that's living his will. But, man, he's going to be like, man, I never knew you. You never spent time with me. How come you never invited me into your house to watch the game with your friends? I would have loved to have been there. I just wanted to be a part of your life. You see, when you commit to Sundays and you commit to a church, that's communicating something to the world. It's saying, I am valuing the things of God. One of the reasons we won't play travel baseball. We love baseball. My son loves baseball. He's really good at baseball. They play and practice on Sundays. He's not going to the pros. Why am I going to waste my time for a $5 ring that every kid gets now? <laughs> because I value the things of God. It's saying that it's God's precedence over my preference. Now, I know my preference, I would have loved to have slept in this morning. Some of us would be like, my preference would be to be at the beach right now and not here. That's our preferences. But you know what? God gets our first. He's more important than our preferences. It's the principle of first. He gets the first of my week, the first of my day, the first of my income, the first of my marriage, the first of my kids, first of my career. He gets the first of my everything. Why? Because I have that relationship with him. I've heard it before. Well, do I don't have to go to church to have a relationship and be a Christian. No, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't. I, too, don't have to go home to be married. None of us do. How good is that marriage going to be if you never time, spend time at home? How good is your job going to be if you never actually go? How good can we say our relationship with Jesus is going to be if we never show up? That's knowing God on a personal, intimate level. And whenever we know God, we can, number two, we begin to cultivate your relationships. Cultivate your relationships. Begin and develop those relationships. Salvation, that comes from knowing God. That comes from Jesus, plain and simple. But freedom and healing truly comes from community. It comes from relationships. Look at James chapter 5, verse 16. This is going to sting a little bit. Take a deep breath. Confess your sins to each other. Let's pause there for a second. Let's just confess our sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Confess your sins to one another. Does that sound like a good time? No. I don't want people knowing my business. 
I don't want people knowing what's going on in my life. So, man, that's how we get healed. Being in community with other believers, with other people who care about you, who want nothing but the best for you, who you can go to and say, hey, I messed up. Who can call you out on your stuff whenever you have messed up. Say, man, you haven't been a really, really great person lately. Man, I see where you're going, and it's not a very good path. Confess your sins to one another. I think there are so many people who are walking around in salvation, but never are able to experience true healing from past traumas because we refuse to get in those meaningful relationships. Listen, community does not need you, but we need community. We badly need community. Because here's the thing, what I've learned is that community is going to happen with or without me. Relationships are going to be built with or without me. Lives are going to be healed and changed with or without me. People are going to grow in their faith with or without me. So why in the world do I not want to get involved and have those relationships too? Begin and cultivate those relationships. Well, how do you do that? One great way, you want to write this down, join a small group. Oh, it's just something else to do. No, it's not that. It's life-changing, I promise. Join a small group. They're on purpose. They're intentional. They matter. It's how these relationships begin. It's how they're cultivated. They're not easy. They're difficult, but they matter. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Let us not neglect our meeting together. Let us not neglect us getting together and having a conversation. I know they sting. I know they're painful. I know we want to avoid them. But man, that is how relationships are developed. It's how they're built. See, life change happens in circles, not in rows like we're sitting today. Life change happens by getting in someone's living room with a group of people and actually having real meaningful conversations. That changes everything. Relationships, they're they're, they're hard. Relationships are messy. Y'all, people are going through stuff. It's difficult sometimes. But we got to stop writing everyone off every time they say something that we don't agree with. We have to give people grace. Jesus gave us grace. Why in the world can we not give that to other people? To give us grace. To let them know, hey, I'm here for you. Have those relationships. They're messy. They're hard. It's the reason why relationships only last seven years on most parts. Because we get mad. We get frustrated. Listen, people are going to let us down. It's just the way that it is. We're not perfect. We're going to let each other down sometimes. But what does Jesus say about forgiveness? (laughs) One time, right? And you're out. Seventy times seven means I'm going to forgive them every single time. Why? Because I love them. Because I care about them. Do they mess up? Yeah. That's okay. We all do. It's going to be okay. I'm going to be here with you. I'm going to have those conversations. I'm going to walk this thing out with you. But we have to do it together. Those are the relationships because they're worth it. These relationships are truly worth it. It's where life change happens. It's where freedom comes from. It's developing those relationships. And when we know God... When we cultivate these relationships, now it's the fun stuff. Number three, discover your purpose. Discover why it is you exist. The two greatest days we'll ever have, the day we were born and the day that we finally figure out why we were born. Why do I exist? Why was I put on this planet? Because we were all created on purpose for a purpose. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship. Another translation says his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. We were created for works. We were created for a purpose. It's important for us to discover that. And I know what you're thinking. It's difficult to understand what that looks like. Most of the time we're walking around aimlessly just trying to figure out what that purpose is. But because we know God and we have these relationships, we have people who can help lead us there. Last week my wife and I were in Marco Island, Florida. I know, bad us, right? It was awesome. And on Saturday, it was for a work conference. Saturday was more of a free day. We had a dinner scheduled that night. So Saturday, we said, well, let's go see what these guys on the beach are doing with these jet skis. That sounds fun. So we went and looked. Like, yeah, you can rent them. and You can ride back and forth in front of the, the resorts and all that. That's, that sounds like a good time. Not really, though. 
I said, but if you come back at 12 o'clock, we do this tour, this guided tour through the 10,000 islands, which is just off the west coast of South Florida. So we decided we're going to do that. And y'all, it was amazing. It's incredible. I had no idea that all of these little islands existed just off the coast. It was a 28-mile round trip uh, trip on these jet skis. And we went through some places between islands that were no more than this wide. Couldn't even turn a jet ski around there if you wanted to. It's amazing. We saw sea turtles. We saw manatees and dolphins just come right up next to the jet skis. Endangered species of birds. It was just amazing. But here's one thing that I know. Really, anyone can go do this. I mean, it's not blocked off or anything like that. Anyone can go. But if my wife and I would have rented a jet ski and done this on our own, we'd still be stuck on one of those islands right now. We'd have been like Tom Hanks and Castaway, doing the best we can to possibly survive. Lucky for us, we had a guide who had been doing this for 17 years nearly every single day. He knew exactly where to go, the right speeds, what to look for in the water, to be able to see the animals, what side to, to drive on. He knew everything because he's been doing it for so long. I believe that for us to be able to find this purpose that we have, we have to be led by people who are going to help us find it. So discover what it means to live a life on purpose. So how do we do that? So glad you asked that question. Write this down. You want to complete roots. It's on your outline. Complete roots. You're saying, well, what in the world is roots? Roots is something that we offer here at Cultivate Church. You can go to the Cultivate Church app. You can go to cultivatechurch.tv. And it tells you, it's in two sections. We have Life 1.0. It tells you everything you want to know about the church. Why we exist. The backstory. How the church came to be. What we believe. How passionate we are. It's amazing. And then Purpose 2.0. So we get to find out a lot about ourselves. And this is all available online. You can go home and do it on your couch this afternoon. But Purpose 2.0, you'll take a person, the personality profile, which many of us have done that in the, the past. It will tell us how we're wired. It will tell you why you are the way that you are. Your spouse is thinking, yeah, we're doing this after the afternoon. I need to know why you are the way that you are. But the most amazing part of it, after that, you'll take a spiritual gifts assessment. Because believe it or not, every single one of us has spiritual gifts that are nestled inside of us that God gave us from the very beginning. But we don't know what those are. It's tough for us to be able to dig those out and find out what those are. And listen, if you've done this before, I suggest doing it again. Because we're passionate about people finding out what their spiritual gifts are so they can discover what their purpose is, so they can do what they were meant to do, what God had called them to do. Because we are walking around blind and hurt just trying to figure it out on our own. What in the world am I supposed to do? It's life-changing. I did this just this past week. I said, you know what? It's, it's time to do the spiritual gifts test again. Let's see if anything's changed. Have doors opened where maybe I've developed something? What's going on with them? Here are my spiritual gifts, my top three as of last Wednesday. Teaching, leadership, evangelism. You may be thinking, well, that makes sense when you're on a platform preaching. I'm not supposed to be here. Plain and simple, I have no business being on a platform speaking to any of you. You see, there's no preachers in my family. There's no speakers in my family. I'm not supposed to be here. Speaking in front of people, that's terrifying. I was actually voted most shy in high school. I didn't like speaking to people. But God had a different plan. I would have never known that had I not taken a spiritual gifts assessment to find out exactly why I was put here and why I was created. And the only reason those were able to be grown out of me and I was able to do something with them is because of small groups at Cultivate Church. Because our pastors did a small group called Learning to Communicate years ago that my wife forced me to go to. I didn't want to go to it. I said, okay, sure, we'll go. First, first small group uh, that we had said, well, hey, we're going to talk about communication. You're going to learn about transition. And you know what? We're also all going to give a 10-minute message at the end of the semester. I said, that sounds awful. I'm never coming back. God had a different plan. There's something that God put inside of me that he said, man, this is this, this what you're supposed to be doing. Turns out that was my most favorite small group I've ever been a part of. I think it was for a lot of us who, who, who attended that small group. So it brought something out of me of what I was supposed to be doing. I didn't, I didn't know that. Same can be true for every single one of us. We we're all gifted with something special. We just have to know what it is so we can be able to discover what our purpose is and live it out on purpose. 
And when we know God, we have those relationships. We're able to live a life on purpose. Discover what that is. Leads us to number four, find your stride. What's your stride? In other words, what's your lane? What are you supposed to do with all this information, with these spiritual gifts that you have? Ephesians 2.10, just to finish that up. Said created in Christ Jesus for good works, for which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Well, he has works, we're to walk in them, we're to do our part. You know, the funny thing about spiritual gifts, it's very, very honest with you. See, I love music. I would love nothing more than to be a part of the worship team. I can't. Okay, there's a dirty little joke that goes on. Oh, you all ever seen Powers try and clap? That guy can't stay on beat at all. He's got no rhythm. It's true, I don't. That's why I don't dance. I got no rhythm whatsoever. Funny thing about it, my spiritual giftings, yeah, worship and music is at the very dead last bottom of that list. God knew what he was doing. See, I'm not supposed to be up here leading worship whatsoever. It's not my lane. But it's going to take all of us doing our part, which we were designed to do, to live out what God has called us to do. Every one of us, finding out exactly what it is, where we fit, what our place is. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18 through 21. It says, but our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part where he wants it. How strange would a body be if it only had one part? Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. You see, we all have a specific part to play. We all have a role in which to play for the kingdom of God. So how in the world can we do this? How can I find my stride? Write this down. Join a C team. Join a team around here. There's nothing that's off limits. That's one amazing thing about the leadership of our church. Is whenever we discover our spiritual gifts they're not going to try and knock you down and say, well, you can't do that. That's going to take something away from me or from someone else. No, they want you to grow in that. They will do anything that they possibly can to help you grow in whatever those spiritual giftings are. Why? Because they understand, too, that we all have a role to play. And if we all pull in the same direction, if we all play our part and do our role, it's amazing what the Lord can do with that. And we can do that by joining a SEAM team. It's going to take all of us. We can't do this on your own. You need me. And I surely need every single one of you to be able to do this, to live a life on purpose. We're never more fulfilled than whenever we're serving someone else, living our life on purpose. So I want to challenge you. Commit. Give it one year. Maybe you're kicking the tires on this. Maybe you're just not quite sure about this whole Jesus thing, this whole church thing. Give it one year. Commit to a church for one year. I think this is the greatest place going. Give it one year and watch what happens. Just tell Jesus, say, all right, you know what? I'm going to make a bet with you. Because whenever I did that small group I didn't want to be a part of, I made a bet with him too. So said, listen, I'm going to do this. And if you open doors, I'm going to walk through them. But if you ever let me down, I'm done. He hadn't done it yet. I don't think he has any plans on doing that. Commit for a year and watch what happens. What do you got to lose? Because it all goes back to really knowing God. Because listen, when you, when you know him, man, when you know, you know. It's just one of those things. And I get it. I've been skeptical. I understand. It's like, well, how in the world can you know someone and have conversations and relationship with someone who you can't actually see in front of you? Who you can't actually talk to and they'll talk back to you. You can't give them a high five or a fist bump. How in the world is that supposed to work? I get it. I've been there. 100%. But man, when you make that decision, and you say, you know what? I'm going to know who you are. I'm going to try. I'm going to give an effort. You're going to wonder, what in the world was I waiting for? Commit for one year and watch what happens. You'll look back over the last year and be like, I can't believe I was missing out on every bit of this. Because listen, there have been times where I feel like God is right there in front of my face and we're having a conversation. Sometimes it's really awesome and really fun. Sometimes it's not that fun. But that's what true relationship looks like. There are times where I've been going through something or I've been thinking something, worried about something. And I can just open up his word and bam, sure enough, it's right there. 
Exactly what I needed to hear is right there. He will speak to you through other people, the importance of having those relationships. I'm telling you, when you know him, y'all, it changes it all. You'll wonder, how did I not get on top of this sinner? All comes from knowing who God is, having that relationship. I want to pray for you. If you'll bow your heads, you'll close your eyes. Worship team's going to come back up. It's about knowing who God is, having that relationship, like he's your best friend in the whole wide world. And that's where it all begins. And listen, if you're here and you are skeptical, you're just not sure, you're trying to figure everything out, try it and watch what happens. And I'm not saying just say, okay, yeah, I'll try. No, try it. Make a real true effort and watch what happens. I'm not saying that just because I am on a platform talking. I'm telling you from real life, personal experience, he changes everything. He changes it all. And it all starts with a yes. It all starts with a relationship. It all starts with saying, I'm going to give it all to you. I'm going to make it effort. And if that's you, you'd simply say, God, today, I need you. God, I recognize that I've got sin in my life. I recognize I don't have it all together. But God, I'm tired. So today, I'm asking for forgiveness for everything. Today, I am accepting that you sent Jesus to die on a cross for me. And today, I want to make him my Lord and Savior. I want to make him number one in my life. I'm going to commit. I want to give it all. And God, for every single one of us, I pray for our relationships with you, with other people. Pray for our purpose. God, you put people in our lives specifically for certain reasons. God, I pray those relationships are brought closer together, that they're cultivated in the way in which you design them so we can be better equipped and better prepared for the journey that you have ahead of us. Because we're much better whenever we do it together. We are never meant to do it all alone. And God, I pray that for every one of us, we'll be able to lock arms with each other. We'll be doing it in a way that makes you proud. God, I'm praying for opportunities for all of us. Personally, relationally, spiritually, give us those opportunities to lock arms with each other and pursue you. And we'll give you all the credit for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we give him some praise this morning? Come on.